Hello everyone and um, welcome to uh, this afternoon um, event. I'm really delighted that you're all being able to join us. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Professor Pauline Walsh and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean at uh, Keele University for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Um, and uh, up until uh, the beginning of this year, I was chair of the RCN Education Forum. Um, but having done my time now, I've handed that over to uh, Sarah Burden, um, who is ably carrying in this on. And um, one of the, um, th this event this evening is a joint event um, on behalf of the um, RCN History of Nursing Society and also the Education Forum. And uh, so we're really pleased that we've been able to bring this together. So today we're talking uh, about uh, nursing before Florence Nightingale. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to um, uh, introduce actually a colleague of mine from Keele University, who um, uh, Alana Tompkins, who is a professor at Keele and um, her, has um, worked at the history department uh, since 1995. She remains there, uh, history is now within the School of Humanities at Keele. And her research uh, so far has focused on the poor law and on medicine. Um, her most recent book, and I need to read this title properly so I don't get it incorrect, is Medical Misadventure in an Age of Professionalization. And it's about mostly Victorian medical practitioners who struggle to meet the criteria for professional life. Her research continues work on the English poor laws up to about 1834, and now also takes in the experience of women who undertook nursing work in the period. And that obviously is well before Florence Nightingale or any of the calls for nursing reform. Examples of her research on nurses are available online um, in the UK Association for the History of Nursing Bulletin. And um, she hopes her next book will be about nurses in England, 1660 to 1820s. That's quite a good time, time piece. So um, I'm absolutely delighted, as I said, to welcome Alana. And actually, what a great title that we've got this afternoon. So. Um, I'm going to hand over and let Alana um, give us a really um, interesting talk this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Um, I just want to say um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak in the Royal College of Nursing um, seminar series. Um, and um, I'm always very grateful for an opportunity um, for, to share my research. So thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, what I want to do in this session, if I can find the next slide, is um, this is to show you what where my talk's going so you get an idea of what material I'm covering and how you're getting through the material and when you're near the end. Um, nurses at work before the career of Florence Nightingale have a poor reputation. A new book about nursing in the Crimea, which was published as recently as 2019, describes them as belonging to the lowest rank of domestic servants. There might have been some women who were adequate, but in general, they were regarded as unreliable in carrying out doctor's orders and worse, that drink was a dreadful problem for them. These assumptions are fed into public history and heritage. So the current leaflet for St. Bartholomew's Hospital Museum, covering the whole period for nursing 1123 to the present, I picked this up most recently in um, May, 2019, um, gives an anecdote. Um, about women who nursed there in the 18th century. All three female workers in Luke Ward of St Bartholomew's Hospital, so that's to say the sister, the nurse and the night watch, were discharged on the same day in 1791 when they were all found drunk. This story makes a neat backdrop to what followed in the Victorian era in the form of Nightingale inspired nurse training. But I think it's a distortion of the evidence of nursing activity in hospitals in the period before nursing reform was even remotely considered. So this paper will discuss the presence of nurse employees in London at St Bartholomew's Hospital and in other provincial hospitals 
in the years before and up to Nightingale's birth in 1820. It will place occasional notice of drunken nurses, nurses so there, there were one or two, um, but it will place them into context and argue that women typically performed well in their roles according to the requirements placed on them. So, histories of nursing up to now have been written entirely with Florence Nightingale in mind, it seems to me. In contrast, this research that I'm doing stands in 1820 and looks backwards rather than forwards to find views of nurses that are not substantially influenced by later expectations of training, vocation or becoming a nurse professional. There were very few women before the 1850s to act as heroines or defenders of the pre-reform nurse, although I'm going to try and wedge one or two into the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, so watch this space. This is important because nursing's reputation from the mid-19th century underwent such high-profile change that it's difficult to escape from Nightingale's gravitational pull, as I think of it, and consider nurses before that period as anything other than simply unreformed. Her contemporaries writing in the 1840s and 50s pointed to women's mistakes in administering medicine or following practitioner directions. Received opinion on the character of nurses at this time was that they hailed from a very low class and that drunkenness was their besetting sin. But was this a real problem or was it a stereotype that didn't reflect real life? Or if nurses were all this inadequate in the 40s and 50s, were Nightingale and others pointing to a problem that had always existed in the same way? Or had nurses before the 1840s been more highly regarded, or at least less likely to attract criticism? This begs another question, it seems to me, why hasn't anyone looked at earlier nurses before now? The difficulties of separating sick nursing from other varieties of nursing activity have meant that few historians of women's work have really tried to get to grips with the topic. There are significant difficulties of identifying sick nurses, as historian Margaret Pelling has pointed out, because where the only description of a woman is that she was a nurse, it's not always possible to distinguish between nurses for the sick and children's or nursery nurses who looked after the young, irrespective of their state of health. So it is difficult to find nurses in historical sources reliably unless you go to the archive of an institution like a hospital. And here I should mention two, um, a predecessor, so a French professor, Jacques Carré, who did work 15 years ago, which started to unpick the pre-reform nurse, and also my current colleague Erin uh, Spinney, a Canadian colleague who's doing uh, her darndest to um, write a, a positive history of um, nursing in the Navy before Florence Nightingale. There is another problem as well um, around the way that early Victorian people made assumptions about women. They assumed that men and women had very different abilities and that women were suited to caring but that they were best suited to working uh, inside their family's home. Women who worked in other people's homes, or worse, in institutions, did not fit the early Victorian ideal of appropriate femininity. And women who, worked, who required pay in exchange for caring were even more suspect. Reformed nurses overcame these impressions somewhat, but even in the 20th century, um, quote, domestic work which when performed in the home enhances a woman's status has quite the opposite effect when performed outside it in the public realm, unquote. That's a historian on modern ancillary um, tasks. This suggests to me that we need to look again at the evidence around nursing work before the Victorian period and before the first calls for nursing reform. Therefore, I've been reading the minutes of hospital trustees from St Bartholomew's in London and from provincial infirmaries to find out what they say about their nurses. The first thing I did was to collect the names of nurses working for different hospitals to work out how they got the job and to calculate how long they were employed for. When they left their posts, was it because they were sacked or for another reason? Did hospitals reward their female employees either with praise or with money over and above their salary? St Bartholomew's Hospital employed lots of women. In, by 1660, each of the 15 hospital wards had one sister or senior nurse and one helper who was her assistant. A hundred years later, each ward had three female members of staff, the sister, her helper or nurse, and a woman to watch the patients at night. This means that by 1800, there were 99 nursing women working across the hospital, one sister, one nurse and one watch for each of the 33 wards, and each ward had about 10 or 15 beds. Provincial infirmaries were much smaller, with more patients per member of nursing staff. So Stafford Infirmary, for example, uh, my local uh, historical example, opened in 1766 with just two wards, one for men and one for women, with a single nurse in each ward of around 17 patients. Therefore, the experience of working at St Bart's was very different to the experience of working in an infirmary outside of London. 
for one thing, there were greater expectations on the women in London. At Bart's, the rules for sisters required them to avoid foolishness and, quote, above all things, see that you avoid a bore and detest scolding and drunkenness as most pestilent and filthy vices, unquote. Now you could assume this is put into the rules to prevent, because this is a problem that people have noticed, or you could assume this is somehow um, a preventative, in other words, to try and stop people doing this before they start. The main tasks of nursing were to keep the wards and patients clean, deliver food and drink um, to patients and ensure that physicians' orders were followed for patients taking medicines. The rules in the provinces were much more general, simply requiring nurses to clean their wards and keep, treat patients kindly. This was because in the smaller hospitals in county towns, patients were supposed to help the nurses to look after the ward and other patients, if that is they could move about without putting their own treatment or recovery at risk. The combination of workload, so lots of beds per nurse, and the expectation of patient help made the provincial nurse's job really very different to the one my, you might expect today. I think the BART's job was perhaps nearer um, to current expectations, just marginally. In exchange for their work, the women who were employed at BART's and elsewhere could expect to be provided with a bed, some or all of their diet, so in the provinces you'd have the same diet as the hospital patients, um, at BART's not so much. Um, plus a wage. But the money could be minimal. In Gloucester Infirmary, for example, women were offered four pounds a year, uh, some among the lowest wages offered to live in servants at the time. So this was, um, this was low, even for servants who lived in a, a place of employment. In 1799, the nurses pay in Gloucester went up to five pounds a year. In other words, one of the reasons why early nurses were regarded as rather poor servants was probably because they were offered the wages of a poor servant. Sisters of St. Bartholomew's, St Bartholomew's were better paid, so by 1802 most sisters received over £30 a year, um, but clearly the women who took jobs as nurses were partly determined by the pay on offer. It's not clear who made the selections of women to appoint as nurses or sisters. At St Bartholomew's the matron's word seemed to have counted for a good deal, where the matron was a housekeeper, it has to be said, rather than a senior nurse. Geoffrey Yeo, who precedes me as a historian of St. Bart's nurses, so he's written a book, so if you're keen on um, uh, getting your hands on something about the history of nursing you haven't got already, there's this book by Geoffrey Yeo. Um, he argues that the hospital employed women on the basis of their physical strength. This seems to me like a bit of a rough generalisation, since women could be moved between wards to match heavy duty with physical capacity and vice versa, as women might become elderly in post. The rules made allowances, for example, for sisters who couldn't manage to carry bread, beer and meat from the kitchen uh, to the wards. The matron in 1771 claimed to be interested in women's character and disposition, aligning their ca uh, capacities with the demands imposed by the duties of different wards. The hospital's governors were also interested in women's financial vulnerability, because from the late 17th century, the governors of Barts took an interest in where the nurses and sisters were legally settled. In other words, the parish they could be sent back to if they became poor and needed parish relief. A meeting of the 8th of December 1707 required all new nurses and helpers or sisters to offer security against future risk of poverty. In other words, if they left the hospital's employment and fell on hard times, they would not become a burden on the hospital or on its home parish of St Bartholomew the Less. The hospital sought documentation in the form of what was called settlement certificates to ensure that women who became needy could be sent back to the parish they came from. And I've got an example of one of these um, here in the case of Anne Fordray. Um, Fordray, sometimes her name is spelt with a T at the beginning, it seems to be so sometimes Anne Tordray. Um, and you can see here, she gives basically a potted history of her life, demonstrating that she was settled in um, the parish of St. Martin in the Fields because that's where her, she'd lived with her husband and where they paid rent. In the provinces, the knowledge of nursing jobs was either conveyed by word of mouth to the women who might want them or to the, um, or the hospital governors advertised in their local newspapers. Um, having, having said that, I haven't found an image of a newspaper, such a newspaper advert, um, so they stay in the minutes they're advertising their papers, but I haven't found one, so I would have put it up on the slides if I'd got one. But then there's the question of tenure and promotion. The average tenure of women as hospital employees also contradicts the idea that the work was excessively hard or that women were all appointed in hope and quickly dismissed on discovery of their failings. At St Bartholomew's Hospital, the average time in post was a little over seven years. The longest standing female employee I found so far was a woman called Lettice Dean, who served at least 33 years up to 1721. 
Because the helpers or assistants were routinely promoted to be sisters of Bart's, we can assume that the hospital did at least approve those women who got promotion. One thing I've noticed is that there was a shortening interval between first appointment and promotion to sister over the whole of the period that I'm looking at, so 1660 up to 1820. Basically, the period you had to wait shortened from two and two and a half years to one and a half year, years. This suggests either that staff turnover became more rapid in the second half of the 18th century, or that the increasing number of wards shortened the wait time for the more prestigious job of sister. Perhaps the hospital had to become less picky about the women it promoted. Just maybe. In the provinces, it's harder to track promotion from assistants to full nurses, and staff turnover among nurses was even more rapid, with nurses at Liverpool Infirmary, for example, serving an average of just one year, four months. But this might have had more to do with women's lives and the employment opportunities in the city than with nurse misbehaviour. Liverpool's infirmary minutes almost never record that the nurses were sacked and do not mention drunkenness. Instead, women were frequently reappointed for multiple short terms. Hannah Lucas is not a very uncommon name, but a woman with this name was appointed at least seven times to successive terms of office. Um, so meaning it could have been the same person each time because there weren't any overlaps. The woman with the wonderful name Christiana Dunwoody had a very unusual name and worked in Liverpool until the time of her marriage. She was rehired the following year under her married name, Christiana Pearson, raising the prospect that other women were rehired invisibly. In other words, where their maiden names were less distinctive and I, I just can't see them. Infirmary trustees could even prove flexible where women's circumstances changed. Elizabeth Jones uh, was at the Shropshire Infirmary in the 1790s and left her post to get married, but she was re-employed as Elizabeth Pierce after she'd been abandoned by her husband. The by now pregnant Pierce worked until her confinement and then returned to work after effectually taking maternity leave. This speaks of an institution which was supportive of nurses when they've been proved to work well. So the vexed question of misbehaviour and dismissal. At St Bartholomew's Hospital there are references to complaints against the nursing staff. Drink was specified in a minority of cases, but women were more likely to be guilty of taking too much money from patients, to be rebuked for miscellaneous misbehaviour or for very particular faults such as unwomanly carriage. Um, what does that mean? Walking like a bloke? I really don't know. Um, or in a much more uh, sort of acute case, being with child, which came, came up once or twice in the period I'm looking at. Um, but as you can see, if, but from this breakdown of the types of problem that were encountered, drink, it's present, but it's really quite a modest cause of complaint and dismissal compared to all the other things uh, which might crop up. It's also the case that all the other things which did crop up didn't crop up very often. Um, perhaps there was an average of just more than one complaint a year. And of, the, um, of all the complaints, 63% of the complaints resulted in dismissal. So not all of them, all of the women who were complained about were dismissed, um, which means that women could be judged guilty of a, a minor infraction and still keep their place if they promise to do better in future. From this analysis of complaints against nurses and sisters at Bart, it's clear that intoxication was a risk, but wasn't displayed so regularly as we might suppose from the writings of later reformers. It's also worth noticing that no nurses were reprimanded or dismissed for drunkenness from either Stafford or Liverpool infirmaries, and only one night nurse was implicated in Gloucester. Another thing about the complaints, they gave reasons for the display of support for nurses by the hospital's medical men. I'll give you a for instance of what I mean. At Bart's in 1749, two sisters, Mary Vaughan and Sarah Field, were both dismissed for using ill language and unmannerly behaviour towards the porter and steward. Sarah Field was allowed to go without protest as no one came to her defence, but the surgeons of the hospital petitioned on behalf of Mary Vaughan's reinstatement as she was, quote, a very sober person and very diligent and careful in her ward, unquote. She was restored to her place on promising not to give cause for complaint in future. So a complaint gives rise actually to a, a, a defence of the woman. Nurses in both London and the provinces could be rewarded for good or lengthy service. In Liverpool, nurse Margaret White received 10 shillings for giving extraordinary attention to patient nurse Begley, from whom she caught a fever. An outbreak of gangrene at the Gloucester Infirmary placed unusual demands on the nurses in terms of cleaning and fumigating bedding. As a result, every one of the seven nurses was given a guinea in addition to their wages. So if your total salary is only about £5 and an extra £1.05 is a big deal, 
Even more generously, the governors of Stafford Infirmary gave a one-off payment of 10 guineas to nurse Mary Lee in 1802, quote, as a reward for her long services and strict attention to the duties of her employment, unquote. St Bartholomew's Hospital went on better because from 1784 onwards, sisters who grew frail or uncertain unsuited to working on the wards, could request a pension of 16 guineas per year for the remainder of their lives. The practice of giving these pensions became marked in the years after 1800. This was obviously a lot less than their salary had been, but in an age before any superannuation schemes really existed, this was surprisingly innovative and shows significant hospital support for its former nursing staff. If women's health broke down during their employment, it was usual practice at both Bart's and in country hospitals to admit selected former nurses as patients. Rachel Atwood, for example, was highly esteemed by the trust, uh, trustees of Gloucester Infirmary, and when she fell ill, she was admitted as a patient. Her job was kept open temporarily until it became clear that she would not recover sufficiently returned to work, and then she was permitted to remain in the infirmary for much longer than the average patient, in other words, other patients who'd been found to be incurable. So once we've got over this issue of um, misbehaviour and dismissal, we can get through to this, the issue of nurse stories. More detailed accounts of individual nurses are easier to find for women who worked in London than for the provincial infirmary nurses. For example, I had a go at trying to track down every one of the 39 women who worked at the Stafford Infirmary between 1766 and 1820, and I couldn't find out any more information about any single one of them, which was very annoying. But for what it's worth, some different types of newspaper stories which also disrupt the stereotype. In February 1807, St Bart's played a bit part in a public catastrophe. An execution crowd which gathered to witness the hangings of John Holloway and Owen Haggerty for committing murder on Hounslow Heath was numbered in the tens of thousands. When the crush became uncontrollable, over 40 people were smothered or trampled to death and many more were terribly bruised. The dead and injured alike were taken to St Bart's where one ward was made over to act as a morgue and seven other wards took emergency admissions. The Morning Post interviewed the three men admitted to King Ward, who told tales of people flooding out from side streets and alleys towards the location of the scaffold and being trodden into insensibility. The journalist also spoke to the unnamed sister of King Ward, possibly the first known interview with a nurse anywhere. She was described as being about 56, low in stature, but of robust constitution and perfectly collected. She'd been outside the hospital and caught up in events, being forced into the crowd at the top of Skinner Street. She emerged relatively unscathed, quote, and was much elated at having experienced such a wonderful escape. A shorter but rather different story emerges in the same decade, when a woman calling herself by the pen name Eusabia wrote to the press about her recent experience of hospital visiting at both St Bartholomew's and St Thomas's hospitals. We now know that this woman was Mary Hayes, a novelist, and she apparently saw hospital nurses as quite aloof from their patients, so a rather different sort of portrait. She even described the Bart sisters as, quote, fine dressy ladies, unquote, partly, I think, in reference to their uniform, which the hospital um, issued to them. So two rather different newspaper stories about nurses. Then there are Old Bailey stories. A handful of cases tried at the Old Bailey, which was, a, was and is a very short walk from Bart's, um, took witness statements from sisters and nurses at the hospital. If a person was injured and then died, the evidence of nursing staff could be important to establish whether a person had been murdered. The prosecution of Isabella Buckham for infanticide in December 1755 is one of the best cases I've found so far to shed light on ward dynamics. Briefly, Buckham was ill in Faith's ward, apparently with dropsy. And in the early hours of 7, uh, 20th of November 1755, she visited the privy before complaining, uh, getting back into bed and complaining of wet sheets. Her bed was found to be covered in blood. And when the hospital porter searched the cesspool of the, below the privy, the body of a male infant was found. So you can see here the, uh, the newspaper report, which is of the, um, the coroner's inquest into this finding. Um, Isabella Buckham was um, sent for trial at the Old Bailey for infanticide and her defence at the trial was that she was not in her senses when she gave birth and she was acquitted of having killed her son. More interesting than the potential infanticide, even more interesting for my purposes, is the sequence of events revealed in Faith's ward that night. She was in a ward called Faith's ward and the opinions exchanged between the nurse who was called Anne Smith, uh, the other patients and the role of the nurse, the ward sister. Firstly, Nurse Anne Smith was sitting up by the ward fire between one and two in the morning, and a number of her female patients were also awake. 
She responded to Buckham's evident discomfort by emptying her bedpan, supplying her a second time with the bedpan for her, quote, puking, um, and, um, and warming a flannel petticoat to wrap around her waist. Smith refused to pin on the petticoat for fear of pricking Buckham with the pin, but otherwise she seems to have been pretty attentive and responsive to her patient's needs. Second, other patients were drawn into Buckham's story when they allegedly heard a child cry, and then when the sheets were found to be bloody. Nurse Anne Smith took the sheets off the bed and took them to patient Molly Elger, another patient in Faith's ward, and said to her, look here, she says she never had a child. When Buckham later referred to her situation, she claimed, none but you, meaning the nurse and the people in the ward, can save me. Molly Elger and three other patients um, were, gave evidence at the trial and refused to swear that the body which had been discovered was that of Buckham's son. Third, the ward sister Mary Lewis was alerted to these events and she took charge. She told Buckham that she had had a child and sent for a midwife. Midwife delivered the afterbirth and Nurse Smith carried it away in a basin, providing in miniature an illustration of how the power dynamic between nurses and sisters worked. Mary Lewis instructed the midwife while Anne Smith cleared up after her. Lewis was asked whether Buckham was out of her senses, to which she replied, I can't tell for I was almost out of mine, which may have been a reference to her own loss of sleep or to how unusual it was for a woman to give birth in one of the female wards because St Bart's wasn't supposed to be a, a hospital for pregnant women, or at her distress at the bloody state of her ward because clots of blood fell to the floor when the sheets were taken off Buckham's bed and or finding a dead infant on her watch. This is not a deeply surprising story, but it is nonetheless a revealing one. It shows the ward working in some ways that we might have anticipated, the nurse did the dirty work that the sister gave her, and in ways we could not have supposed, namely the collective voice of the nurse and female patients testifying to the fact of a birth, but not keen to link the child's body to Buckham or to give evidence supporting her guilt. And then we get on to family stories. Now, this is this part of the slide is blank for a reason which I'll come to in a moment. Research on selected women suggests that it was not the newly widowed who applied for secured jobs at Bath, because to get a job at Bath, you had either to be a widowed or a spinster. The marriages of most widows can't be traced because of that family history that's so difficult. Um, given that women lacking distinctive first and second names was always difficult to trace in the marriage records. Um, but I have found five cases. <laughs> so five cases with women uh, with really unusual surnames, things like Diggins and Fitzar, which are not common at all. Um, and on the basis of this very small sample, women obtained work at St Bart's between five and ten years after the onset of widowhood. This suggests that they were left in increasingly straitened circumstances, able to find other ways to get by for a number of years, but ultimately seeking employment um, that supplied both accommodation and community. So I'm going to give you two um, testamentary stories. Some sisters gathered property during their life and wrote a will. Wills have been found so far for a tiny minority of the Bart sisters, so 24 out or 5% or so of the women who I know were sisters in the period I'm studying. These can be used to uncover family stories because widows name their children among their beneficiaries and single women name their siblings, nieces and nephews. So the first of two examples. Mary Collier's will seems to show that she worked at the hospital alongside her biological sister or sister-in-law. Jane Collier and Mary Catterall were appointed as nurses on the same day in March 1736 and both worked at Bart's, all the indifferent wards, until Mary's death in 1746. Mary, uh, Jane carried on working there up until she made her will in 1767 and in her will she asked to be buried in the same grave with her brother and sister Humphrey and Mary Catterall. Now what I can't yet prove beyond question is how Humphrey Catterall, Mary Catterall and Jane were related. Were Humphrey and Mary Jane's brother and sister-in-law um, or were they her brother-in-law and sister? Were they the relatives of Jane Collier's dead husband? So in other words was it Mary Catterall nay Collier and therefore were they both in-laws? The only thing that I can be absolutely sure of is that Jane Collier's identity became subsumed with Humphrey and Mary's when she was buried because when she's buried, she's not given as Jane Collier, she's given as Mrs. Jane Catterall. So her identity becomes subsumed with that from the people she's being buried with, but we know it's the right person because it says St. Bartholomew's Hospital uh, with an O. At the same time, the employees of the hospital could become very important to each other and even like a surrogate family. So, why on earth have I got a picture of ships sailing to or from India to illustrate this point? 
Jane Ailiff and Martha Barker were both employed as ward sisters in St Bartholomew's Hospital and they were close friends who died within a year of each other. Ailiff, who died first, named her, quote, well-beloved friend, Barker, as her exec executrix and sole beneficiary, while Barker's, um, Barker's sole beneficiary was Jane's grandson, Samuel Ailiff, who was a carpenter on, carpenter on board the East India ship called the Admiral Watson. In other words, any property that Jane Ailiff had returned to her family, but only after her friend Martha Barker had inherited it and then bequeathed it in her, own, in her stead. Barker chose as her own executrix one Mary Clayton, identified as Samuel Ailiff's aunt and presumably Jane Ailiff's married sister, daughter. Both of the willmakers, Ailiff and Barker, used a man called John Dale as one of their witnesses, and he was a purser on another East India ship, the Worcester, which is the one that might be depicted in this painting. So clearly, um, Jane Ailiff and Martha Barker, Martha Barker became like family to one another. So I'm nearly done, but um, just to conclude, on the basis of the evidence, I'm going to risk a bold claim that nurses and sisters in London and the provinces performed relatively well in context and that any evidence to this effect has been overwritten. If we stand in 1820 and look back rather than in 1860 and look back, the history of nursing looks much more upbeat and co collaborative with other staff rather than a constant nightmare of insanitary practices and unrepentant tippling. I also suspect that the job changed and nurses were blamed for failing to keep up with new expectations. So, final story. In October 1789, the Shropshire Infirmary Board reported one such change. It having been found that some of the patients frequently neglect taking their medicines and that others take it irregularly and in improper quantities, ordered that in future the nurses take charge of the several medicines from the apothecary and that they be directed to be particularly careful in seeing it duly administered to each patient, agreeably to the directions upon the respective labels. This was a very significant addition to nurses' responsibilities in Shrewsbury and it was not long before someone fell foul of this new rule. Eight months later, in May 1790, Martha Bevan, nurse of the women's ward, was discharged for failing to dispense medicines to patients accurately. She'd been given written directions and she could apparently read, so she was blamed with carelessness. This is a clear instance, I think, of the ground moving beneath nurses' feet and their former adequacy in post becoming recast as inadequacy. But it's the only example of such a dismissal in any of the provincial hospitals I've studied up to the, in the period up to 1820. So I'm speculating that this sort of change undermining nurse reputations became a feature of the second quarter of the 19th century and laid the foundations for happy acceptance of the idea of nursing reform in the 1850s. And that's me done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alana. That was really fascinating. Um, and um, it's clear that we can now see the, where the drug round first started.